Good morning and welcome to WPI. President Dunlop, Provost Hoverstrom, Provost Hefner, uh, chairs and deans, uh, welcome to our campus. Um, it's our pleasure to be the host of this wonderful event. As you know, um, this is a special pleasure for me to welcome you to our campus. RIT is where I first got that pleasure of learning, that pleasure of understanding where passion comes from, learning the sciences and, uh, and engineering fields. My career in biochemistry started at RIT, and as the Dean of Arts and Sciences here at WPI, it's especially a wonderful uh, treat for me to welcome you. It's also the place where, in that first year of chemistry, I met my husband, and it's been chemistry ever since. So, <laughs> Uh, to date, I've actually found four WPI faculty who are alums of RIT. You know, we have a lot in common. We recognize that WPI and RIT share a similar mission as technologically oriented institutions. For those of us who are new to WPI, our RIT home made us feel right at home here. Since its founding in 1865, WPI is pioneered as one of the intersections of education which looked at both the theory and the practice of education. Today, our project-based curriculum continues this tradition. We have full-term projects where students concentrate each term on a project in their junior and senior year. We have a great problem seminar and we've expanded our graduate programs, which now together compose the heart of the WPI plan. WPI is also extremely fortunate to be surrounded by a vibrant community of those who not only study, but practice in the arts, the arts of historians, archivists, writers, documentarians. The Antiquarium Society is certainly the cornerstone of this community, and we are so grateful to have this national treasure right here in our backyard. So today, RIT School of Media Sciences is here to honor our neighbor and our partner, the American Antiquarium Society, with the Isaiah Thomas Award in Publishing. This honor is so very fitting to the Antiquarium Society, and we are so very proud. So as an alum of RIT, as a Worcester community member, and as the dean of one of these historic institutions, WPI, it is my pleasure to welcome you to our campus on behalf of the entire administration. And we would like to send our sincere congratulations to the Antiquarium Society for this very prestigious award. We hope that you have a stimulating and very fruitful day on campus. And I'd like to now invite um, Associate Dean of the College of Imaging, Arts, and Sciences from RIT, uh, Dr. Twyla Cummings. Thank you. Um, I guess I need to get to the mic. But on behalf of myself, uh, Provost Hefner, Dean Justice, and the entire Isaiah Thomas Award and Publishing Committee, please accept the small token of our thanks. Thank you. Thank you. So good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us at this award celebration. In addition to my role as Associate Dean in the College of Imaging Arts and Sciences, I hold the title of the Paul and Louise Miller Distinguished Professor. And it is this endowed chair, along with the School of Media Sciences, that is sponsoring today's events. We use several acronyms at the Rochester Institute of Technology, so I will, of course, just refer to it as RIT. Today we honor the recipient of the 28th Isaiah Thomas Award in Publishing, which was established in 1979. This award, which honors leaders in the newspaper industry, is named in tribute to an early leader of the American publishing industry. One of the many criterion for this award is someone who has demonstrated career achievements and has been a role model for students, 
pursuing careers in the fields of printing, publishing, and media sciences. Past recipients of the Isaiah Thomas Award include Alan Newhart, founder of the Freedom Forum and, the U and USA Today, Catherine Graham, president, Washington Post Company, Arthur Salzberger, Jr., chairman of the New York Times Company and publisher of the New York Times, and Thomas Curley, president and CEO of the Associated Press. Joining the select group today is the American Antiquarian Society. This is the first time the award has been presented to an organization rather than an individual, or in the case of last year, a group of individuals, when we presented the award to seven RIT Pulitzer Prize winning alumni who won a combined 11 Pulitzers in photography. In bestowing this award on the American Antiquarian Society, we also honor Isaiah Thomas, who founded the society in 1812. The society's vast collection of history, literature, and culture documents the life of America's people from the colonial era through the Civil War and Reconstruction, including Thomas's printing legacy. This year, the society celebrates its bicentennial as the first national American historical organization. The theme for this year's award ceremony is celebrating the life of a patriot printer, a tribute to Isaiah Thomas. Throughout the course of this morning's program, you will learn about Isaiah Thomas and how he advanced newspaper publishing in the 18th century. You will also hear about the media innovations at RIT, the College of Imaging Arts and Sciences, and in the School of Media Sciences. And we will find out whether in the 242 years since Isaiah Thomas launched his newspaper, if the mission of news has really changed and how its history has been preserved. We will hear much more about the society and its distinguished founder later in the program, but at this time, it gives me great pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Lorraine Justice, the Dean of RIT's College of Imaging Arts and Sciences with the official welcome. I'm a little vertically challenged. I hope you can all see me over the podium. Thank you, Twyla. Good morning. On behalf of RIT's President, Dr. William Destler, the College of Imaging Arts and Sciences, and the School of Media Sciences, it is my distinct pleasure to welcome you to the 2012 Isaiah Thomas Award in Publishing. We are so honored and appreciative to the Worcester Polytechnic Worcester, sorry, Polytechnic Institute, the American Antiquarian Society, and the Museum of Printing for their gracious generosity and for making us all feel truly welcome. It is RIT's mission to lead higher education in innovation and creativity. As we work towards these goals, it is associations like the American Antiquarian Society that we rely on as a resource to guide our research initiatives and to provide an historical perspective of the news publishing sector of the printing industry. I think its founder would appreciate the many ways in which RIT partners with industry, involving students in important research projects and paving the way for successful careers. He would be an enthusiastic supporter of the news media initiative and the applied research projects that our faculty and students engage in that furthers our understanding of the news media industry. He would be impressed by projects from the RIT Press and the Open Publishing Lab. He would marvel at how multiple issues of innovation news are generated in real time during the Imagine RIT Festival and other live events as a means for generating instant news. He would also be astounded at the creative and compelling images captured by our photojournalism students, and he would appreciate the collaborative efforts that are occurring 
with the School of Media Sciences, the School of Photographic Arts and Sciences, and the College of Liberal Arts Journalism. RIT is known around the world for its educational programs and facilities in the print and publishing industries. As this year's honoree celebrates their 2000th anniversary, the School of Media Sciences is proud to celebrate their 75th anniversary throughout the entire academic year. RIT and the School of Media Sciences are fortunate to have the industry support of media companies such as Gannett and EW Scripps. Additionally, through the work of our endowed professors in the school's new media initiative, we are very focused on conducting research on issues relevant to the news media publishing industry, offering courses on the changing world of news media, creating strategic partnerships with news media companies, industry associations, and suppliers. Disseminating our work by attending conferences, giving presentations, and sponsoring the Paul and Louise Miller Lecture Series and this Isaiah Thomas Award. And by engaging students, by creating programs and events for them and developing co-ops and employment opportunities. And we have several students with us here today so they can enjoy this event. This award is named in honor of a history-making publisher, printer, and patriot, with a capital P. We are very honored to pay tribute to his legacy by recognizing the contributions he made to the news publishing industry through the founding of the American Antiquarian Society. So with that, I would like to turn the podium back to Twyla, who will introduce our panel. Thank you. Thank you, Lorraine. The topic for today's panel discussion is preserving the history of news in a digital age. The newspaper industry has gone through a series of dramatic shifts, changes, and challenges. This has resulted in a situation where many newspapers no longer offer a print version of the paper, but instead are embracing multimedia platforms for the distribution of digital news content. Today's panel will focus on the challenges of preserving and accessing artifacts from the history of print journalism and the challenges associated with converting print documents to digital format. So let's see what this group of professionals has to say about all of this. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our distinguished group of panelists. Our panel moderator, David Pankow, is the director of the RIT Press a university press dedicated to exploring new publishing models and technologies of dissemination. The press deploys a broad array of publication technologies, including print editions for scholarly and mass market audiences, print on demand editions with options for digital delivery of content, born digital editions that offer media integration opportunities, and limited editions with unique aesthetic features for specialty audiences. Professor Pankow has recently retired from his concurrent position as curator of the Melbert B. Carey Jr. Graphic Arts Collection at RIT. The Carey, Carey Collection is a comprehensive library of original resources on printing and bookmaking history, graphic arts processes, and typographic exemplars. Bruce Galtney, is publisher of the Worcester Telegram and Gazette. He came to Worcester in April 2006 from Ocala, Florida, where he was publisher of the Star Banner. Prior to becoming the publisher in Ocala, he worked as editor, operations director, and then general manner of the, manager of the Star Banner. Mr. Galtney is a current board chair of the United Way of Central Massachusetts and has served as its campaign chair. 
He also serves on the boards of the Worcester Regional Ch Chamber of Commerce, Commerce and the Worcester Education Collaborative. I can say Worcester now, can't pronounce other words. <laughs> Vincent Golden has been the curator of newspapers and periodicals at the American Antiquarian Society for the past 10 years. Since that time, he acquired over a quarter of a million newspaper issues for the collection. Prior to coming to AAS, he worked in special collections at the University of Illinois for 10 years and was the rare book librarian at Illinois Institute of Technology in Chicago for four years. He routinely gives back to the academic community and has volunteered at the University of Virginia's Rare Book School for the past 15 summers. Dr. Tracy Ledger Hornby is the Dean of Library Services here at WPI. Prior to this, she was Associate CIO at Brandeis University, Director of the Regina Library at Revere, Revere College in Nashua, New Hampshire, and preceding that worked in the Simmons College Libraries. Dr. Ledger Hornby has served on the Board of Trustees of the Northeast Regional Computing Program and is the co-leader of the Professional Development Constituency Group and serves on the EDUCAUSE Quarterly Editorial Board. She was contributing author, author of the ebook entitled Cultivating Careers, Professional Development for Campus IT. Alex Regala is the senior media arts and technology major in the School of Media Sciences at RIT. He is the editor in chief of Reporter Magazine, RIT's award winning weekly student news publication. Alex began writing for the reporter in fall of 2008. Shortly after entering RIT, he edited the magazine's leisure and feature sections before becoming its editor-in-chief in March 2012. He is currently working with the talented staff of student writers, editors, designers, photographers, and illustrators to help reinvent the publication's online presence. Last, but certainly not least, RIT Professor Emeritus Frank Romano's career has spanned 53 years in the printing and publishing industries. Many know him as the editor of the international paper Pocket Pal. He is the author of 52 books, including the 10,000 term Encyclopedia of Graphic Communications with his son, Richard Romano, the standard reference in the field. He lectures extensively and was the principal researcher on the landmark EDS, EDSF study, Printing in the Age of the Web and Beyond. He has been quoted in many newspapers and publications as well as on TV and radio. He appeared on the History Detectives PBS program and serves as president of the Museum of Printing in North Andover, Massachusetts. What an impressive group. So at this time, I'm going to turn the program over to our moderator. Like Lorraine, I'm vertically challenged as well. <laughs> <clears throat> well, thank you, uh, Dr. Oates, for uh, hosting this event here at WPI. It's an honor to be here, and I know panel members uh, feel exactly the same way. Uh, we're delighted to be part of the process of helping uh, the American Antiquarian Society celebrate uh, its bicentennial this year, and I'm very much looking forward to seeing uh, the exhibit on Isaiah Thomas when we go over there later this afternoon. Earlier this summer, I had the occasion to go out to Colorado uh, to settle my mother's estate. It was a very sad and uh, moving experience for me because one of the discoveries I made was uh, a scrapbook that uh, she had kept when she was in her teenage years and her early 20s. And it was a scrapbook that consisted of many, many clippings from newspapers from her town and the different places that she had lived during that period. Uh, there were photographs in there, there were other memorabilia, but what I, 
uh, was most alarmed by were the clippings and the condition in which they were in. Now, this is a treasure to my family and I because it represents a part of my mother's history that we didn't really know very much about. But at the same time, it's the kind of artifact that my family and I are very worried about handling. How are we going to care for this? Do we make preservation photocopies? Do we digitize it? What do we do with the original itself? How do we ensure that the information it contains can survive for future family members? So if I am feeling terrified <clears throat> on this level with caring for this document, <clears throat> excuse me, imagine how much more uh, curators of collections like Vincent working at the American Antiquarian Society and other similar repositories, imagine the feelings that they have and the responsibilities they have for caring for newspapers and other artifacts that represent hundreds of years of history and which offer opportunities to <coughs> scholars and to social and political historians and to genealogists and to other researchers, uh, opportunities to look at the history of this country on a day-by-day -day basis, a week-by-week -week basis, town-by-town, city-by-city. And so what I'm hoping that we can accomplish today is to have a discussion uh, and hear a little bit from these experts, both from the preservation repository side as well as from the newspaper side, how they feel uh, it will be possible to help these great records of our history survive well into the future. We're going to uh, take about 40 minutes or so for the questions to the panelists themselves. <clears throat> and then we'll leave some time at the end to see if anybody in the audience would like to ask questions as well. So my first question is to Vincent. Uh, you're the curator of newspapers here at AAS and care for an enormous number of early American newspapers and other examples of print. What percentage of your users are interested in the physical artifact and what percentage would be satisfied with the digital version of the content? And one follow-up question, how does that drive your preservation policies? First of all, I think um, a lot of people, when they come to the American Antiquarian Society, they come with the purpose of using the originals. Um, that's what we're noted for. We're a big old building filled with big old stuff and small old stuff. <laughs> that's, what's, that's what's on our sh shelves. Every month, we pull between 100 and 300 volumes of newspapers alone for readers to use. And yet, when we when a new reader comes, we introduce them to the digital products too. We give them an orientation. Here's how you find things in our online catalog. Here's how you make requests. And here's our databases. And we introduce them and how to use them. Um, and a lot of people do use them, but we also, when we train them to use them, we also sort of give them caveats. Not everything in our collection is digitized. If we have a, we've had a long-standing relationship with Redex. This is a company that has been uh, digitizing our newspapers. They microfilm a lot of our newspapers since 1962. They've been uh, digitized, I should say digitized, photographing our early American imprints um, since 1955. But like our newspapers, if they just concentrated all their resources on digitizing what we still have in our stacks, they take a minimum of 15 years to get through it all. So when they say everything's on the internet, no, it isn't. <laughs> and I keep acquiring, so they got to keep catching up to me. <laughs> and that's my goal. I got to keep ahead of them. <laughs> I mean, in a way, um, there's still problems with um, using these online resources. Whereas you can casually skim through a newspaper when you wait for each image to load, you've got that lag time that people just aren't used to. They're used to the high broadband internet popping up, 
and it, here this is slow, and it, nope, that's not what I want. Back, click. No, that's not what I want. But on the other hand, because it is full text searchable, they're finding things in ways that they've never imagined before. I'm sure looking out, there's a whole group of faculty already telling their um, doctoral candidates, in my days, we had to read the stuff. <laughs> now they're doing keyword searching, and they're finding things in newspapers they wouldn't even think about looking at. But I still give them caveats, because this is still an emerging problem. Newspapers, a lot of the times, there's only one or two copies that have survived of a newspaper. It's not in good condition. It's stained, it's torn, it's wrinkled. And when they kept to digitize it, and then try to OCR it because of the stains, the wrinkles, the tears, there's a very low accuracy in the OCR. And so it's not going to pick up everything, especially proper names. I found that no matter what database I use, if it's some weird spelling of a proper name, the, that's almost invariably has problems with it. And when you get into the 18th century, the, um, the long S, um, they're getting better now with trying to adapt to um, account for that. But there's still problems with, if you know it's an S and the computer says it's an F. The computer's telling you no, and you're saying yes. And it can create some inter interesting results. Um, I won't delve into further, but um, let's just say you end up with some rated R results. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's an emerging thing. I'm, like I said, our um, American Antiquarian Society, they give us a repository of originals, but we've been working with Redex when all these new technologies emerged. Um, well, these, the newspapers were first published in micro-opaque cards. For those of you who aren't familiar with micro-opaque cards, think of microfilm without the joy. <laughs> it's a horrible, horrible format. <laughs> then they went to microfilm. And now they're going to digital. But what they're doing is they're digitizing from the microfilm. And with all of those faults that I talked about, like the stain, you know, you have a light brown paper, you've got a dark brown stain, you've got black text, you've got the original in front of you, you can work your way through the stain and read the text. On microfilm, it's a big black blotch, totally illegible. And that's what they're digitizing. But fortunately, because AAS saves the stuff, Redex has found problems. Sometimes they skip the page. They miss something. They put in a request. We'll, we still have the original. They can, we can bring it down. They can go back. In 2001, um, Nick, Nicholas and Baker came out with a book, Double Fold, a mild little tome about the problems of microfilming newspapers and everybody throwing away the originals. With this huge NEH new US newspaper project for microfilming, a lot of places they film the papers throughout the originals without ever checking the film. There's stuff that is out of focus, where they missed frames, they, they missed whole issues. There's one case of an upstate New York library, public library, I won't name which one. They microfilmed the newspapers, threw away the originals. They put out for the readers to use the master negatives. They didn't put out a reading copy. Somebody stole the master negatives. They don't have the originals to go back and reshoot. It's lost. So with digitization, I'm beginning to see some of the original same problems. People are rushing in, we're digitizing. And they're satisfied with, oh, we've got this. They're not just realizing you've got issues again with legibility. Um, one of the reasons Redex is shooting from <coughs> microfilm. There's limitations to shoot directly from the original newspaper. With the technology that they have, 
they can shoot up to about a 22, 23 inch tall newspaper. And when you get larger than that, you get something probably called spherical aberration, where the edges start to curve. And once the lines start to curve, the OCR goes to hell. Google, they had an archive database of newspapers. They were digitizing newspapers. They stopped that because they were running into so many problems they couldn't solve technically. They just said it was too much problem and stopped. There's a case of a public library in Maryland. They got a grant, they digitized all their newspapers. The images are sitting on a hard drive because they didn't have any money for servers, technology, or to hire somebody that knew what to do with it. So they got the images, nobody can use them. So we're, we're seeing all these little uh, teething problems coming along. We'll, we'll solve them, they solve them with microfilm sometimes. But we don't know exactly what the problems are yet. We don't know how we're going to solve them. But in the meantime, we, American Antiquarian Society still has the originals. People can still come in and use it. I mean, if you do come over to the exhibition, I'll give you one example. I have opened up a volume of the Massachusetts Spy with the obituary of Isaiah Thomas. It's digitized. Because of the binding, right where the margin is, it goes right into the margin, it curves in. If you look at the digital image, you can't read the stuff in the margin because it's bound too tight. <laughs> but, say 30, 40, 50 years from now, somebody comes with a new technology that can read into that margin and digitally straighten it out, well, we still got the original. Thank you, Vincent. It sounds like you've got job security. <laughs> My next question is for Bruce. As publisher of the Worcester Telegram and Gazette, you have seen many changes take place in the newspaper industry over the last 20 years as it copes with the demands and expectations of a digital world. What responsibility do you think newspaper organizations have for ensuring the survival, digital or otherwise, of their issue archives morgues, and photo collections. Well, let me start, I guess, with the, sort of the first part. Um, you, you're definitely right. The newspaper industry is experiencing a great deal of change as a result of the expectations of the digital world. But you know that's true in virtually every aspect of our lives. I was talking with two college presidents recently about uh, the impact of the, internet, of the internet learning and what it's going to be have, what it have on education, on higher education. And I was struck last night as an example of how digital is reshaping our lives when I was at the wonderful event in the Museum of Fame. And my wife gets a text from our babysitter who is asking for the password to our Wi-Fi so that she can do her homework. Um, so it, you know, it permeates her everyday lives. I was also pleased to see when I got home, I said, so did you get on? And she said, yes. I said, so what was your homework? And she said, my journalism class. I'm making that up. I said, good. <laughs> now she said, this is hard, by the way. I, I see our transformation to a digital news organization as a tremendous opportunity for us and our audience. If you look back through history, you'll see numerous transformational periods in the news business. The mass adoption of radio and TV, just to name two. Newspapers endured, even though at the time, they could not fully utilize the new products. Today, though, we can utilize the same digital tools and products to make news available to everyone. And in every community, daily, still have the largest news gathering organizations. We now have the ability to provide breaking news to your smartphone, to provide video of news events, to digitize searchable records, and interact with our readers as never before. And we not only use these tools for presenting the news, but also for sourcing and gathering the news at a much faster pace. One of the advantages of digital information is that it makes so much available but that can be a dis disadvantage as well. We have found that brand matters more in the digital world than ever before. Just as I might not consider getting an online degree from an educational institution I'm not familiar with, I would stand in line to take an online course from RIT or WPI. So too in the news world, I turn to names I trust, the New York Times, and of course the TMG. Because I know that up not all that passes for news and information on the, web, on the web is always credible. 
So to save time and make sure we get it right, we turn to the brands we trust. In Worcester, as in most communities, that news brand is a local daily. It just happens to be now available on your iPad, your laptop, your smartphone, or still in the paper format. Now, as to the preservation of those records, I, I speak a little bit there about our mission continues, but as to the preservation of the records, as a regional community newspaper, we take our leadership role in chronicling the story of Central Mass for 146 years very seriously. And we do see it as part of our responsibility to ensure that a complete record is kept of our published work. If, as it is said, newspapers are the first rough draft of history, we should help to preserve and protect that record. Now, uh, while we have not yet digitized our archives back to 1866, and listening to Vincent, I know we need to talk more. Uh, although I know our staff has already been, uh, speak, spoke with uh, the Antiquarian Society. Um, other papers in our company, the New York Times and the Boston Globe, have both dig digitized uh, all the way back to their first uh, papers. For now, we have ensured that we have the master copy of uh, microfilm safely tucked away from 1866 to 1989. And uh, we are continuing to explore our uh, options as far as digitizing those reels. And that's the area of those reels. Uh, although they're original to the uh, first, so yeah, uh, uh, some copies. But, um, but we are, we are going to be dealing with that. So, uh, we have, we have spoken with some companies who are working with us, and really it's just a matter of time determining what's the best course of action that best fits our business needs as far as uh, digitizing those records. I'm confident we will, uh, we will get in there. In the meantime, uh, like every paper, we provide uh, sets of our uh, microfilm readable sets to the public library for the public, and um, we, um, we have pres preserved in digital format since uh, 1989, which is a, sort of a common place for regional paper. The, uh, just as one example, I guess, of, of the importance that we put on our work product over the years, we recently, as many of you in Worcester now, we recently moved from a building we've been in for more than 100 years. And uh, as we began to think about that process, moving to a more modern workplace, uh, one of the teams that was responsible for that said, okay, we have a lot of material here. It is amazing what you can find in nooks and crannies of a 100-year-old uh, so we contacted the Worcester Historical Museum to see if they would be interested in any of the materials that we could not move into our space. We donated our biographical clipping files and photos to the museum, and they're sorting those photos, pulling out Worcester uh, connections, scanning them, and making them accessible to the public, and preserving the, the photos themselves as part of a TNG portrait collection. They're doing the, uh, the same thing with biographical clipping files. So they're making those uh, into uh, preservation copies, and, uh, and again, taking note of those that are historically significant. And we've also, uh, we donated our uh, cartoon collection from the Notre Dame Banks to the, the Worcester uh, Public Library. So we're trying to find, and then, and then of course, we took a lot of the clippings with us. You know, newspaper clipping libraries were busy places before there were so many records available digitally. Uh, journalists, myself included, uh, under the pressure of deadlines, were always digging through those files. It was, it was a work product. And so occasionally clippings or photos were lost. Ellen told me last night we, we were looking for a photo of her. We couldn't find it. So <laughs> it does happen. But, uh, but those clippings did provide a paper trail of important stories in our history. I'm, I'm thrilled that those clippings are now um, safely at the Historical Museum and they're uh, cataloging them and, and making sure that and uh, again, as I said, we moved several with us as well. Um, so uh, it's just not really good about each other. It's a little bit about what it's like. Thank you, Bruce. It sounds like you've uh, taken some very responsible steps about caring for the legacy of your newspaper and made some very sound decisions. By the way, uh, if I asked you the question, do 47% of Americans pay their taxes? you'd be able to turn to one of your trusted sources and find out for me, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> My next question is for Frank Romano. In many ways, you have the broadest perspective of anyone here on how dramatically the graphic arts industry has evolved. 
and you'll soon be publishing a book on the history of the linotype machine, which I am happy to say we will be publishing through the RIT Press. You're an expert on digital publishing technologies, but also manage a printing museum. Now, it seems likely that print and digital will be able to coexist in a book environment, but can they exist in the world of journalism? Should museums of printing expand their mission to document the development of digital publishing as well as from the print era? A few years ago, at RIT, we had some of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And they were used in the Imaging Science School on a scanner that they had. And I was only a few inches away from something over a thousand years old. And I said to myself, what if they weren't the Dead Sea Scrolls? What if they were the Dead CD-ROMs? <laughs> what would we do with them? And I have now lived through the evolution of media from paper tape and punch cards to magnetic tape to hard drives, to floppy disks in three different sizes, uh, through the era of the SideQuest drive and disk, the magneto optical, the zip drive and disk. How many remember the zip disk, by the way? Yes. How many remember the click of death? Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, and then through um, the CD-ROM and now the DVD. And now, of course, they're going away as well. Um, Sony closed down the last plant in the U.S. that made CD-ROMs. Uh, the DVDs are still made, but mostly for the media industries. Um, we're now told that we're going to store everything in the cloud. Well, what is the cloud? It's a group of hard drives somewhere in West Virginia. Um, or somewhere where there's inexpensive electrical power. So we, we have a problem with storing not only the information, but the media and technology that is used for it. I was on a committee for the Library of Congress on how we would store information that would be accessed into the future. And so they worked with Adobe to create an archival version of PDF, PDF slash A, assuming that that would then be something that could be readable far into the future with text and graphics. We hope that will be the case. As with media, we are now every few years refreshing the media by taking the data from one medium and storing it on another. The uh, government printing office, even if the document is only in electronic form, doesn't exist as paper, they still print 20 copies of it. And they go to the depository libraries in the United States because to the federal government, the only medium that has existed for 236 years has been paper. And so that's what they now use as the primary storage uh, technique. Uh, even though many of the products that the government does are in electronic form, such as the congressional record, which you can access every morning at 5 a.m., but you wait a few hours more to get the paper version, and I don't know of anyone that actually reads the paper version I was on the committee that created the electronic congressional record, and we interviewed several senators and representatives, and, uh, and they all said, oh no, I might want to take, put it in my briefcase and take it home at night. And I wanted to say, to do what? Burn it? Uh, you're certainly not going to read it, because if you want to find anything, it comes with an equally sized publication, which is the index. And uh, as a result, most people use Thomas, which is the Library of Congress system, named for Thomas Jefferson, uh, where you can search for anything uh, using Boolean searches or whatever online, and you can print it out in any form that you wish. So the problem is we have to store this information so that it will be accessible into the future. And today, most people are scanning material. The, the problem with microfilm, of course, is it's not searchable, whereas uh, at RIT, we recently scanned the Inland Printer magazines, the first magazine for printing in the world, from 1883 to the early 50s, I think it was. Dave. 1950. Mm -hmm. And um, and that database is that publication is searchable. You can find anything you want. In fact, I recently went around the world and took that file with me, and was accessing historical information as I traveled. So. We have to put information into a form that's not only preservable, but is also searchable, 
so that we can get to the material we want. There's also another aspect, and that is, what do we preserve from the, the old world, how we printed? And I'm specifically looking at printing, because um, I'm the president of a museum of printing, one of only three left in the United States. The Smithsonian closed down their printing exhibition. They replaced it with Julia Child's kitchen. Oh, and Archie Bunker's chair. <laughs> And all of the artifacts are in deep storage. I recently had a student uh, from the University of Reading uh, come to visit me to do research, and we went down to, to, to visit, have access to some of the material there. We had to go to Bethesda, Maryland, to an old, drafty, cold building, which had almost no support facility for researchers, and that's where we could have access to some of the stuff that is in deep storage. So we have some of the machines of the era. We have some of the printing presses. We have a whole newspaper press from 1888 that printed the Hingham Gazette for 80 years. We have a, a Whitlock press that printed the last letterpress newspaper in New England, the Milford Journal. Um, and by the way, the last issue was printed in 2004, which is interesting. Still using that technology at that time. But our problem is that virtually every day we get an email from someone who has something they want to donate. We don't have the space or the ability to handle it. And that's the issue that a lot of our history in the printing industry is disappearing. Uh, and it, it's very sad. Uh, we also have a very large collection of photo typesetting technology. And that's a technology that existed for 40 years and then disappeared. Uh, those artifacts over time will disappear. Uh, we've done some work at RIT in terms of what would we preserve from that era that we could reasonably keep in one room rather than trying to have all the machines, perhaps some of the artifacts and documents and <laughs> material. Uh, a few years ago, um, the family of a man named Edward Fry donated his collection. It was in a house in Chappaqua, New York, and it had sat there for 50 years. But he had started collecting it in 1895 on the death. It just stayed in the house. The house was empty for many, many years. Many of our members went, we collected it all, over 100,000 pieces. He collected every publication, promotion piece, paper sample, typographic sample from the period 1895 to 1945. Hmm. It is an unbelievable historical capsule of what happened during that period. And we've had uh, uh, students from Emerson College assisting us in preserving it and we are starting to scan it, and scan it at high resolution in a searchable form. It's going to take years for it to happen, but we think it's important into the future to have access to what happened in the past. And so with news or other information or other artifacts of our lives, I think it's important to have people in the future know what we did in the past. Frank, I have a collection of zip disks for you. <laughs> you better take them. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Our next question is for Tracy. You have many years of experience in academic libraries and are an expert in the implementation of digital technologies for libraries. To what degree do you think that newspaper collections continue to represent an important resource for general academic audiences? And are, your, are, are university libraries, to your knowledge, working with the newspaper industry to ensure the survival of or perpetual access to digital editions of newspapers? about how you find what is out there to make it available 
and to preserve our own collections. Um, most libraries have a very long range view of the collections. In the past, we used to collect physical artifacts, books, newspapers, journals, and we used to spend a lot of time, we still spend a lot of time worrying about how, how we bring materials in, what to bring in, we don't have everything, and how to store it. We had different formats, like microform. Everyone's talking about fish. Here's, students may not know what this is, it's fish. <laughs> you need a special reader with magnifying and lights, but you could use a magnifying glass and good, good eyesight to be able to do that. Microforms, microfilm reel, we still have a lot of these around and we have copies of the New York Times back from the original um, edition on microfilm. It makes you dizzy to look at that, but you can still see it. And um, we have paper, our student newspaper. We keep the paper copies in the library. Um, so we had many subscriptions in the past. Now um, we, uh, let me see, we have six that we get paper subscriptions we still receive into the building. In the past, we used to get a lot more, but it used to be a delay. If you wanted to read um, the Financial Times or another uh, international paper, Le Monde or whatever, it would take a while for it to arrive in the building, and then we would put them on sticks. Um, you'd have a, a big rack, and you'd have the newspapers hanging, and then people would come in and pick up the paper and, and read the paper in the building. Now, you can get a lot of that through the internet, and through our subscriptions, we enable anyone at WPI to gain access to things that <coughs> the library subscribes to it, and if you're on campus and authenticate, identify yourself as a person here, you have access to these things. So we are a consumer of the newspaper industry for our students, faculty, and researchers, and our primary goal in providing access is to provide primary resources, primary sources. What is happening in the world and can you get to that data? And from a historical perspective, can you go back and see what was happening by reading the accounts in the newspapers? So we buy newspaper subscriptions, not one at a time anymore, um, primarily as part of a package. So if you're a consumer at home, you buy usually a cable subscription package, and the cable subscription package may be the sports package, and it has golf and tennis and football, and you may only be interested in hockey, but you get the bowling and the whatever it is, you get the package, and the price is usually fixed for that package. That's how we buy newspapers, in a package. It comes as a bundle, and you can't say, oh, I'll take this, but I won't take that. You get the bundle. And we are part of a buying club to get the best price possible for that, but we don't always get the selections that we want. But we also list in our catalog, through our access, um, many open access sources, the free versions, which may or may not be there, and it's kind of you get what you pay for. One day it may be there, the next it may not. We also collect, as I held up, the student newspaper and have historical documents for the university. The student newspaper is a critical piece of the university's history, and we keep copies in the archives at uh, WPI. And we have recently been um, digitizing them through a grant that's been made possible um, through the state, and um, hope to have those uh, issues available online. Um, they are not indexed, though, so if you wanted to find a particular person, um, who was at WPI who had a story or a sporting event, it, we're not quite there yet. It's a long process. And we are trying to find support for that, um, but it's not something that um, is on the top of the list right now. As we build our repository, we are worried about discovery. How will people find our materials? The access, will it be easy for them to get them? And long-term issues around preservation. How will we keep this stuff going in years and years and years to come? If we post items but no one can find them or they can't download them, it's lost. That item doesn't exist to people outside of our community. 
we have a couple of gems in our collection, and um, one of those is our student um, reports. Students here work on a lot of projects, and they publish their project reports, and those re receive hundreds of thousands of hits um, online. They're available, but only online since 1999. If someone wanted an earlier one, they have to come and see us, or we have a huge gap, uh, those items are missing. So for academic libraries, we are most interested in the discovery, and that is um, related to the optimization of our information on um, search engines like Google. Like Google. Um, the standard name formats, how do we know it's a particular person that we're talking about when we identify these, um, these students or issues that are on um, our database. So the last concern that we have is about cost and, and coverage. So the current library marketplace is quite volatile in terms of these packages that I've been describing. So a vendor will put out a new kind of a product, and then when the digital formats first came out in the CD-ROMs, we would still get the print, but we had to also, if we wanted to get the CD-ROM, we had to buy the two together. You couldn't buy one without the other. We still have that um, I issue right now, so there's certain subscriptions we buy, and we have to, if we wanted the print, only, you get the online too, or vice versa. So as we look at our budgets and how they've been shrinking, um, the cost of acquiring material has continues to um, increase, and we have to make tough choices. What are the things that we are going to get? What are the things that we are not going to be able to provide? So we have started buying things an article at a time, rather than a subscription at a time. We call it document delivery. Somebody identifies a particular item that they want. It may be less expensive for us to purchase it at $50 an article than at $10,000 a year for a subscription for items that we receive in the library. So we are struggling with trying to keep the access. It's very important to us to keep newspapers, um, particularly as, a, as I said, a primary resource. And in the early days of collecting these items, we were talking about gaps, we used to worry about keeping a, collect, a complete run. Did you have every single issue? Was it, did you get all of the boxes of film? Now, because we license it, that is out of our control. When we are licensing newspaper uh, or journal subscriptions, we are getting out of the cloud and we have no control over what is included in that package and what is not. It's not something that we own. This is in the library. Unless somebody steals it, it's ours and we can refer to it. But if it's something that we license and the vendor either goes out of business or decides that's not included, they want to put something else in, what we were paying for, we thought we had, we don't have any longer. And that's an issue for us, particularly as we get used to having things and they become important entities for our students to be able to do their research. So we're struggling with that, we work with vendors. Um, the last part of the question is, um, how do we work with the industry? We don't directly. Um, we are buying products through a third party generally, and so we don't have direct connections except with our student newspaper, and we're um, working with them to make that uh, available for historical purposes. Um, the state of Massachusetts is currently um, trying to gather resources so that all libraries, whether public, academic, school, or special libraries, have access to the citizens and residents of the state of Massachusetts for general materials, including newspapers, and we're struggling at how to make those available um, to everyone in the state. So I sit on a resource sharing committee, and we're working with um, other uh, outside groups to see if there's something that we can take back the content. Um, libraries are considering becoming uh, information providers ourselves, rather than being dependent on commercial entities. Um, it's still in a very spark-like uh, concept out there for us to be able to do that, but as the prices of things go up and up and up, um, it may collapse and we need to be thinking about the future and how to make sure our students are still able to get the materials they need to do their research.
Thank you, Tracy. That was a very cogent explanation of what libraries are confronting today as they try to decide how many print editions to acquire of newspapers, as well as how to manage big collections of newspapers that are provided in digital formats. One of the things that I've always found interesting, or I'm starting to find it interesting, is how it's going to be possible for researchers of the future to uh, understand how digital editioning is going to be working. If you think of how many newspapers, digital newspapers like USA Today, for example, over the course of a single day, they will add stories, new stories. Uh, I don't know if they're actually documenting when those stories were added to their website or if it'll be possible for a scholar 100 years from now to see exactly when news became news uh, on USA Today as well as other newspapers. Well, thank you, Tracy. Uh, my last question is for Alex. And I've saved you for last because you represent a generation of users and practitioners in publishing who have grown up digital. You are the editor-in-chief of RIT's student newspaper, The Reporter. And my question for you is, do students still appreciate a print edition? Well, I'm a bit of a bias source here. I'm kind of a print junkie. Um, I think it ultimately depends on what sort of publication it is. Um, to kind of pull things back out to kind of the whole macrocosm of publishing in general, I believe um, you did mention earlier, David, um, that as far as books go, there is kind of this realm where print and digital can coexist. Um, the realm of e-readers is still a very, very new venture. It's still in its infancy. Um, and I actually was reading the other week, um, there was, a, I believe, a study done by some um, publishing trade group um, that showed when, basically talking about university textbooks, 75% um, of students preferred to have an actual print edition. And uh, there were various reasons for this, um, some of which was just the immediacy of having it there. Um, others were basically, you had some sort of resale value, um, that you had some tangible object. Um, now, as far as news is concerned, um, on the immediate kind of just, if you're looking at the news industry as a broad um, spectrum, I don't think that really translates over right now from what I've seen from my generation. Um, I think one of the things you're seeing with this generation is we're very connected. Um, social media is a huge part of our lives. And I think a lot of news is kind of getting disseminated through that as one major distribution mechanism. Uh, most people I know who read news in my age group um, they don't go to a traditional paper. You, sometimes you have people who might be accustomed to reading, for example, um, my hometown paper, um, I'm from Philly, um, the Intelligencer. I used to read that, used to hit up the comics every morning when I was a kid. Um, but if you don't really have that kind of loyalty, a lot of people, what I'm seeing is they're very interested in getting a very specific type of news. They're more interested in what the content is than where it's coming from. Um, and really, with the internet, one of the advantages is you have this vast platform of information. And basically, at the click of a button, you can access papers in basically any city around the world. You can access the New York Times, the Boston Globe, all with the click of a button. And you don't even need a subscription the way current models work. Uh, so I think a lot of it with social media in particular, um, what I'll see most of my friends doing is they'll be online, they might find an article that they find interesting. Um, they'll read it, then they'll share it on Facebook, they'll share it on Twitter, they'll do that sort of thing. Um, and these are the way friendships usually work. People tend to have common interests. So what is just one friend who wanted to be shared? And news sort of seems to spread that way from what I've seen. Uh, I've seen a lot of really interesting things posted on Facebook um, that I wouldn't have noticed otherwise. I might have kind of glanced over if I'd been looking at an actual just print newspaper. Um, it actually ties into, um, I'm not sure the entire actual name, but I know there was um, Wired Editor-in-Chief Chris Anderson back, I want to say maybe like seven or eight years ago had um, developed this publishing model and this theory called the long tail theorem. And basically what it states is when we go into this digital sort of age, um, based on more publishing online, that means that a lot of different things, whether it's a newspaper, whether you're talking about music, whatever specific discipline you're talking about, um, the demand kind of rises for these smaller, more specialized interests. Um, so rather than just looking at general, okay, here's a newspaper, you have, you might have had two or three area back um, but now you have access to all these like niche publications, um, which might not have had an opportunity to print back in the day, which might not have had a chance to really reach a large audience. 
And I know that's what I'm seeing a lot with some of my friends personally is they find these communities, these smaller communities that are interested in. Um, and I've seen it as far as the newspapers. I know um, RIT actually we have a program with um, student government, I believe student affairs. We distribute in um, several locations on campus. Um, they have these newspaper boxes. And basically, if you're a student, if you have a student ID, you swipe it, you can get a free paper. Now, one of the challenges I've heard that they face is actually um, a lot of the papers actually are professors, faculty, that sort of thing, who've taken a class as a student <laughs> and have that access um, who go on and seek those papers. Um, I haven't seen many of my friends take them. I usually hit it up every morning when I get a chance for a copy of the New York Times. Um, but the one interesting thing in here, too, though, is student publications are sort of an anachronism in this. Um, if you look at, um, I was reading actually on Pointer, which is kind of this journalistic institute. Um, one of the things they were saying, I believe, a few months ago was they did some study that students actually prefer. Well, they generally get most of their news online now. They, for some reason or another, they didn't really speculate in the article. Um, there wasn't a direct answer. But students preferred the physical print edition. Um, and one thing I would posit this for is probably this apostrophe because it's sort of a niche market. Um, one of the things is they mentioned actually was that the print edition seems to have more draw for students. It's there, it's kind of an iconic part of campus culture. Um, now, the websites, what they also said was that a lot of these sites are more popular with alumni, they're more popular with um, prospective students. And it's interesting that this ties into specific one of the challenges which reporter faces now. Um, RIT recently sold its Gossam in 2000, which was our last traditional um, massive web offset lithographic press. Um, basically, that's not the way the publishing industry is going to be going now. Um, there's not as much demand for that sort of high volume printing. Um, so what we're doing right now is we're working to basically redevelop our presence. Um, we're currently in online magazine, and that's probably going to be switching sometime within the next year um, to a less frequent print edition with more news online basically daily um, to kind of hit that market. And it's interesting, since we made this announcement, since we talked about it, um, I've heard a lot from people within the campus community. Um, and we've had a website since about 2000. We've had a website for about 11, 12 years now. Um, I remember right after we made the announcement, one of the most common questions I got is, so I heard you guys got shut down. Um, <laughs> No one has, I guess a lot of them, our website's right on the front of our magazine. Um, but it's something I guess has been publicized as much. And one of the more curious answers I've gotten from a few people, they've actually said, um, if you don't have a print issue, I'm not going to remember to go online. One of the joys of walking around campus, seeing it, maybe the cover draws them in, and then they start reading. Um, so that's one kind of challenge which we have to look at now. Um, though there are ways which, Campus papers are making it work. Um, one I found particularly interesting, um, and if you have a Facebook account, I encourage you to go check it out, it is um, Onward State. It's a Penn State news publication. It's not their official college paper. Um, they're kind of their own entity. I believe they describe themselves as sort of a news blog. Um, but what I find interesting about them is they publish, um, they have their own website. They don't have a print edition. They publish the bulk of their content basically on Facebook. And they have a fantastic Facebook page, basically every hour on the hour, they're updating their front articles up constantly, they're putting up their pictures of different campus life, it's a really beautiful chronicle that really fits into the way students consume media. And I noticed like a lot of my friends, I'm from Bessemer area of Pennsylvania, a ton of my friends go to Penn State. Um, and it's basically this thing didn't exist four or five years ago, and now it's completely ubiquitous up there, it's everyone knows about it, and everyone visits it. And it's one of the more interesting facts I've heard, too, is actually with a lot of these student publications, um, the websites that have more success are ones that have their own unique original content that doesn't just mirror the print edition. Thank you, Alex. It sounds like you get your news from two sources, traditional print. You go to that kiosk and pull your New York Times out every morning. And also, uh, a lot of news comes to you through uh, the curation of friends on social media which is very interesting to me. Twyla, do we have time for a few questions? Five questions or five minutes? Okay, all right. <laughs> Here's how this is going to work. We have two microphones in the far aisles here. Uh, if you can get up and walk to a microphone, that would be great. Uh, if you have some impediment, we'll bring the microphone to you. But let's take 
uh, two or three very quick questions. You can ask an individual panel member or you can address your question to the panel in general. Hi, um, I'm Mike Cervaldi from uh, Computer Science here, but also uh, the uh, RIT of Masters in uh, 1979. So, uh, I'm sure almost everybody's read George Orwell's 1984. And you know, there the government was always re revising history, so they had to collect all the old books, throw them away, and, and print the new ones with the updated history. Uh, digitally, of course, it would be a lot easier now. So the question is not even worrying about the government, but how would you make sure that as these digital things get archived, that even individuals or organizations would start modifying them? You know, 47%. Uh, well, on a particular site, maybe it's 27%, and nobody remembers that it was 47%, that sort of thing. Thank you. Frank, you want to take that one? You were talking before about sure. the GPL. Give, give me the, <laughs> the impossible one. Uh, well, it's, it, it comes down to security printing. We, we have a big problem with forgery counterfeiting, uh, pharmaceutical packaging is, is so we need to figure out some way to preserve that digital image in a way that it cannot be changed. But once it's in digital form, there aren't too many technologies that lock it in. And uh, no one's thought about the 1984 scenario at this point in time. There's just so much information out there that's duplicated in so many different ways. If you were going to go back and change history, you would have one heck of a job. Thank you. Sir? Hi, my name is Dave Walden. Um, I'm interested in anybody's comment on how to cite uh, digital material. Um, traditionally, we had a way of building bibliography, a way of citing uh, through footnotes and so on. Today, many websites have you know, 50, 60, 70 cryptic characters, um, that maybe end with one PDF. Uh, that are completely unsuitable for citing. They assume you're going to bookmark it digitally, but um, a lot of us are still working in print citations. Um, plus, the, the, the content is changing all the time. It needs something of what's the date, what's the time of the thing was published. How does one deal with citations in the digital world? Thank you. Tracy, uh, Vincent, you want to fight over that one? Um, there are actual uh, formats that are used in uh, academic publishing. So the uh, MLA and the APA, they each have a standard format. And there are ways now, special tools, to capture, as you are looking at the site, the citation. Um, we use a variety of tools. We recommend the students do it. Uh, EndNote, and there are other bibliographic management tools. Um, basically what you're doing is saying that on this day, at this time, I looked at this. And you qualify it, that it was there when you looked at it. And then if it's not there later, at least you have something that says that you looked at it. So there are tools that, um, that exist to be able to, to uh, cite things. One of the things that uh, you want to do as a producer of a page, if you want it to be durable, is that you create a, a durable um, there are acronyms all over the place and ways to do that. You register it, basically, and say that it's a permanent URL if you want something that's going to last so that people can keep coming back to it. The problem is if you're an organization where somebody says, oh yeah, well, now we're putting this new front end on the end, you know, this particular uh, domain is gonna change or somebody is gonna, gonna move. So the trick is to establish a structure that you try not to change if it's something that you wanna have last or if you're a consumer, to use one of these tools that helps you um, establish this and to say when you looked at it. Those are kind of top, top tips on how to manage it. Thank you. One more question. Uh, I'm uh, Jock here. I have a question about sort of historical research in this uh, new world. Uh, typically, people look at the digital and analog as sort of uh, as substitutes for each other, not complements. Uh, and I'm just kind of curious. When Tracy, when you're showing those different uh, different techniques, clearly there must be qualitative differences in terms of what people take away. So if you have a keyword search, you already know what you're looking for, and that ended up being more systematic, and that's great. But when Vincent was talking about the paper, that almost gestalt of seeing things that are really hard to model from a computer standpoint. I'm just curious, have people done any studies to get a sense of what people gain and what people miss? 
this in terms of looking at these different formats uh, in terms of what a research would actually take away versus looking at a page and seeing things they weren't looking for. As the way nylon, they weren't looking for nylon. They kind of came, they came upon it when they were looking for these polymers. And so there's more surprise sometimes that comes up in the gestalt as opposed to already knowing what you're looking for. Thank you very much. Well, I think this has been an enormously interesting panel discussion about the issues involved in preserving the news. And I'm sure that if there are more questions, all our panel members will be very happy to answer them for you after this uh, uh, formal event concludes. And I want to thank each one of them for taking the time to be here today, uh, for answering thoughtfully and thoroughly all of my questions. And I hope you found it as interesting as I did. Thank you very much. I would like to thank our moderator and our panel for sharing their knowledge and insights on this very important topic. There's a gift, I think it's behind your chair, um, that uh, we want to uh, present to you. It can't repay you for your time and for your enormous talent and your great resource of information, but we ask that you would please accept it with our sincere thanks. Let's give our panel another round of applause. While the panel is moving to their seats, we'll just keep going. We're here today to present the 28th Isaiah Thomas Award in Publishing. But before we do that, I would like to introduce Professor Christopher Bondi, who is the Administrative Chair of the School of Media Sciences at RIT. And he's going to share more, about, uh, more with us about the great patriot printer, Isaiah Thomas and his impact on the news publishing industry. Thank you, Twyla. As Twyla mentioned, the School of Media Sciences is celebrating its 75th year in existence, and the Isaiah Thomas Award in Publishing is one of the most significant events included in this year-long celebration. But today, I shall answer the question, who is Isaiah Thomas? your kind permission, sir. I believe I can answer that question. I believe you have the stage. <laughs> well, you see, I am Dr. Thomas in the flesh. I have vaulted into your time through the powers of Professor Cummings. Although I must admit that it, I am surprised that a woman would be a professor at a college. <laughs> or for that matter, president of my own antiquarian society. <laughs> but these women are extraordinary. Indeed, Dr. Cummings has orchestrated my presence before you now. While I come from another age, I share with you a love of printing the art from which all other arts derive. And in my time, we also preserved printed materials digitally. We held them carefully in our fingers. <laughs> I myself am a printer and a bookseller and a stationer by trade. Indeed, most Americans in my time learned to read from my primers, study their geography from my textbooks, uh, pass their time with my novels, plant their crops by my almanacs, and worship with my Bibles. I have sold books to learned gentlemen and to poor farmers, to skilled craftsmen and to shopkeepers, the finest ladies and the bawdiest wenches have all turned my pages. And for all of that, 
I have been amply rewarded. By God's good grace, I have amassed some $200,000, one of the largest fortunes in these United States, the country I helped to create. Now, I learned the trade of printing from my apprenticeship with Mr. Fowl, Zechariah Fowl, was a printer and a seller of ballads and peddlers small books. Although he was honest in his dealings and punctual to his engagements, Mr. Fowl was uncommonly ignorant. Oh, he was an irritable and an effeminate man, a better skilled in the domestic work of females than the business of a printing shop. Despite his promises to my mother to provide me with a good school education, his printing office was the only school I ever had. I was left to teach myself. I was made to do all the servile employment of his family that I could manage. And when that work was wanting, he placed me at the type cases. That is, I was put to setting type for the press. Why, I was so small at the age of seven years that in order that I might reach the boxes for the upper and lower cases of type, he had a bench 18 inches high built for me to stand upon. <laughs> well, as I matured, I began to understand the mysteries of the trade and to comprehend the possibilities in the art. Mr. F. had an ink-stained Bible and a tattered dictionary, and with these I learned to read and to comprehend that each piece of type was vested with a great transcendental power, that each sort was potent with possibilities well, by the time I was 16. I verily burned with a desire to acquire a perfect knowledge of printing. Oh, I left Mr. F. Without heed to the fact I was bound by law to stay with him until I reached maturity, I sought to go to London, the very center of the English printing world. <laughs> uh, but alas, I fell short of my goal. I landed not in London, but in Halifax, Nova Scotia. And it was in Nova Scotia that I first started fighting for those rights that each American holds to be inalienable. First, I rallied against the Stamp Act, and then later, back in Boston, for independency from Great Britain. My printing establishment was called the Sedition Foundry, in 1770, I started a new newspaper for the middling class entitled The Massachusetts Spy. It soon became the most widely read paper in all of the colonies, and in it I published the first printed account of the first eyewitness accounts of the battles of Lexington and Concord. And above the masthead, I proclaimed, Americans, liberty or death, Join or die. I have always believed in a free and unfettered press. Should the liberty of the press be once destroyed? Farewell, then, the remainder of our invaluable rights and privileges. We may next expect padlocks on our lips, chains on our legs, with only our hands left at liberty to slave for worse than Egyptian taskmasters, or or fight our way to constitutional freedom, the freedom of the press on which depends the freedom of the people. The revolution caused general distress and commotion that was harmful, oh, very harmful to my business. The subscribers to the spy, which had numbered some 3,500 souls throughout the colonies, now shrunk to 200. I faced destitute circumstances. Often my meals consisted of a penny's worth of bread and milk that I would eat with my apprentices in the shop. And gradually, through hard work and determination, my condition improved. In addition to the spy, I continued to publish almanacs and gradually was in, able to increase my business to include the publication of all manner of, of books and pamphlets. After the revolution, my business prospered. 
I erected a paper mill and set up a bindery, and thus I was able to go through the entire process of manufacturing books. I set many of my apprentices up in businesses of their own, which became branch establishments in my publishing empire. At the height of my business, I controlled some 16 presses throughout the country and employed some 150 hands in Worcester alone. I had a controlling interest in three newspapers, a magazine, and eight bookstores in Massachusetts, New Hampshire, New York, and Maryland. I retired from active business pursuits in 1802, and I devoted my energies to writing the history of printing in America. This two-volume work was first published in 1810, and I am surprised and delighted to find that it is still consulted. In the year of our Lord, 1812, I founded the American Antiquarian Society, the first historical society national in scope. When I founded this institution, I remember thinking, we cannot know what will come in the future but we can know the past. We must preserve that past for the future. It is the debt that we owe our forefathers. Today, you have given me a glimpse of what has come after me. It is a wondrous vision. Thank you, and God bless. Dr. Thomas, I have heard so much about your incredible career, and I must say, it's a pleasure to finally meet you. <laughs> Thank you for enlightening us about your background, your numerous accomplishments, and for accurately answering the question, who is Isaiah Thomas? Let's give him another hand. <laughs> At this time, I would like to invite Dr. Jeremy Hafner, our Provost and Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs to come to the podium to present the 2012 Isaiah Thomas Award in Publishing. Thank you, Twyla. It is uh, a real delight, of course, to uh, be here to present the Thomas the Isaiah Thomas Award for Publishing. Uh, to me, it, it's a special award because it has such a deep legacy here at RIT. It has a deep legacy of what it represents as well. So it's a special treat in my role to do that. And of course, uh, amazingly enough, uh, what makes it even more special from the other times we've made this award, we actually have Dr. Thomas with us. So. And I'm a little confused because, you know, while I'm very happy to give it to the American Antiquarian Society, I think we also should give it to uh, Dr. Thomas as well. So, uh, but it's kind of funny to give, his, give himself his own award. I mean, we'll have to figure this one out. Anyway. It's also a delight to visit WPI uh, and, of course, the city of Worcester. Uh, we did conduct an informal survey on how you accurately pronounce uh, Worcester. Uh, you saw some of the uh, results of that survey earlier today. Uh, just so you know, if you come to Rochester, it's not pronounced Rochester, it's called Rochester. So <laughs> keep that in mind as well. Well, let me congratulate the American uh, Antiquarian Society on its bicentennial. What uh, a tremendous milestone this is. It, it's fitting that as you celebrate your 200th anniversary, that RIT recognizes your efforts in preserving history. And at the same time, we honor the man, Isaiah Thomas, who started this legacy that the American Antiquarian Society has sustained. We celebrate Isaiah Thomas, this incredible visionary, who was one of the most influential colonial newspaper publishers. RIT's Isaiah Thomas Award in publishing has certainly come full circle. 
The universal relationship with the American <laughs> Antiquarian Society goes back more than 30 years. Bob Hacker, a professor emeritus at RIT, who was unable to join us today, struck up a friendship with Marcus McCorison, the AAS President Emeritus. Marcus would come to RIT to attend the Isaiah Thomas Awards, and he traveled to RIT in the early 80s when contemporary publishing legends like Edward S. Lowe, Catherine Graham, and Arthur Schultzberger were honored with the award. Marcus enjoyed these trips to RIT because as a historian, it gave him the chance to meet these present day newspaper executives and see how far the newspaper industry has come in 200 years. And it was in, eight, sorry, in, 18, in 1981, under Marcus' leadership, that the American Antiquarian Society gave RIT an original copy of the November 9, 1808 issue of the Massachusetts Spy, Isaiah's most famous publication. And each year since the donation, RIT has proudly displayed it, and we thank you for your generosity in giving us a piece of American history. It is through this award that RIT has been committed to recognizing Isaiah Thomas's foresight in the newspaper industry, his spirit of entrepreneurship, and his advocacy for freedom of the press. And I can tell you right now that that advocacy is needed more than ever in today's society. It's only appropriate then to honor the society that Isaiah Thomas founded and financially supported. The 2012 Isaiah Thomas Award in Publishing is presented in two parts. The first is the traditional silver bowl, which is designed by our own master smith, uh, silversmith professor Len Urso from RIT School of American Crafts. The bowl is presented in conjunction with an ornate certificate designed by professional calligrapher Chris Holmes of Bigelow and Holmes that you see on my right. So congratulations to you on receiving the Isaiah Thomas Award in Publishing. Now, at this time, I ask Ellen Dunlop, the president of the American Antiquity Society, and Isaiah Thomas to come forward to accept the award. Ellen. Some of you heard me say last night that uh, above my, next to my desk, near my computer terminal, is the key to Isaiah Thomas's tomb. Um, <laughs> I haven't had to use it because Neil pops up all the time <clears throat> on his way to uh, yet another school presentation uh, to tell the story of the founding of the antiquarian society, but also of the decisions that he faced as a small boy and the opportunities that he was given and to inspire in them uh, an appreciation for history as it is being made. Um, I wanted to share, begin my remarks by saying that I am here to accept this award and I do so with great pleasure, but I do it on behalf of the entire staff of the American Antiquarian Society. We have a remarkable institution of people who work every day to acquire, to preserve, to catalog, to digitize, to make accessible uh, this comprehensive collection uh, to all comers. And they do so with great generosity and professionalism. And I am very much honored to be their colleague. I also want to accept on behalf of our board, our, our council as it is called, and in fact our members throughout the country. Uh, we love this institution and we are greatly honored by this award you've given us. Um, so I do think as I look at that key and I see Neil, <laughs> uh, sometimes what would Isaiah think of what we are doing at the Antiquarian Society today? And I think that he would be proud for several reasons. Like Isaiah, who organized his businesses vertically, <laughs> we too have tried to be very entrepreneurial in the work that we do. 
the digitization that we have undertaken has brought a great financial bounty to our uh, institution. And we have tried to invest that money wisely in uh, long-term ways that will preserve, that will increase not only the collections, but our capacity to make it available to others. Um, like Isaiah, we have been uh, fascinated by technology and uh, uh, what it can bring to our enterprise. And we have also, like him, been steadfast in our open-mindedness about what we collect. Uh, Isaiah, in his time, knew uh, that what was in vogue among the common folks were just as important as what was read by the, uh, the elite drawing rooms of his day. And uh, we had an incident just two weeks ago in which um, someone questioned something that we had put in an exhibition that we have in New York currently. Uh, to his mind, he thought it too um, uh, crude, too racially charged uh, to be in a public exhibit. And I have to say, when the very topic of take, idea of taking something out of this exhibit was posed, it was so foreign to me. I, I can't imagine censoring what we collect and what we preserve and what we make available to others. And that, I think, is very much in keeping with Isaiah's vision uh, of open-mindedness uh, and the, view, the openness to various points of view. Uh, like him, we are committed to preservation, <laughs> uh, and uh, we are also very much uh, dedicated to maintaining his point of view that books and pamphlets and newspapers are what made this nation. And so to study not only how they were printed, but how they were consumed and the influence that these texts had in shaping our society is his original and very far-sighted vision for uh, someone who came from such modest circumstances and was so completely self-taught. Uh, I think Isaiah Thomas would be pleased with his decision to found the American Antiquarian Society in Worcester. We have been inland out of range of the British fleet <laughs> and uh, we have um, been so um, uh, fortunate to be in this community where uh, we have been so richly supported over these generations. Uh, I think he would appreciate the fact that we have fun when we come to work. <laughs> uh, but he would also, I think, uh, take great pride in seeing how each of the staff members of the Antiquarian Society goes about the work, uh, the dedication that they bring to their tasks, because, like he said to you today, his concept of paying the debt that we owe to our forefathers is very much an obligation that we feel uh, honored to be able to discharge. And he, as our forefather, <laughs> is uh, the embodiment of, I think, why we do what we do and the way we do it. So it's great honor to be uh, accepting this on behalf of this great institution. Thank you. So now I would like to invite Dean Justice and Professor Bondi to the podium for a special recognition. Well, um, I have to tell you, I, I thoroughly enjoyed that talk, uh, Isaiah. And I'm really interested in the multiple streams of income that you created while you were alive. I think our entrepreneurs can, can learn from that. Um, also, I have to tell you, last weekend I had the opportunity to meet Jack Canfield, who did, who sold over 500 million Chicken Soup for the Soul books. And I think I need to talk to him about chicken soup for the antiquarian society soul. It sounds like we've got a lot of good stories. So anyway, um, I'd like to add my congratulations to President Dunlap 
at the American Antiquarian Society for this well-deserved honor. While the focus of today's event is to recognize the recipient of the 28th Isaiah Thomas Award in publishing and to reflect on the accomplishments of Isaiah Thomas, it also serves another purpose. There are people that we encounter in life that influence the decisions we make and the directions we take, both in our personal and professional endeavors. At this time, we would like to recognize and honor one of those individuals. This person has certainly influenced the lives and careers of many of our faculty and staff, alumni, and more at RIT. He is very well known and highly regarded in the publishing industry, and we in the College of Imaging Arts and Sciences and in the School of Media Sciences are benefiting today from his efforts in the foundation he laid during his tenure at RIT. Although we can never repay him for his many contributions and acts of kindness, today we would like to give a special recognition to Professor Emeritus Frank Romano. Please join me in congratulating Frank. We will have remarks from Frank shortly. But first, first we'll have Chris tell you a little bit about Frank Romano. Chris? Thanks, Lorraine. Anyone who knows Frank is keenly aware of the many accomplishments and contributions to the printing and publishing world. With everything he has done to further the field, nothing compares to his impact on so many lives, especially students, faculty, and RIT. This is why we want to celebrate Frank. Earlier, Twyla read a portion of Frank's biographical sketch, but there's not enough time to read this biography as it would easily take one section of the Library of Congress. So rather than give you the listing, um, I suggest you Google him. Or better yet, you can find him on YouTube or whatthethink.com. I think you'll get a much better picture of why this honor is being bestowed on Frank if you hear from f some former students and industry pundits have to say about him and his impact on their lives and on the printing industry as a whole. First, Eric Lehman, 1997-1999 RIT alumnus and the pre-media facilities coordinator at the School of Media Sciences. It means a world to me that I can consider Frank, Uncle Frank, a teacher, a mentor, a colleague, and most importantly, a friend. It doesn't hurt to be a card-carrying member of the Romano Mafia either. <laughs> Uh, Ron Goldberg, 1999-2000 RIT alumnus and Director of uh, Alumni Relations for the College of Imaging Arts and Sciences. Having Frank as an instructor and co-authoring two books with him while a student at RIT, I learned so much from him. I consider him a mentor, a teacher, a partner in crime, and also a card-carrying member of the Romano clan, and most of all, a friend. Gisela Delgado, 2002 RIT alumna, uh, site manager for New York operations of the Virtus Corporation. The day I heard Frank talk about printing, or better yet, the future of printing, something sparked up in my brain. I was too focused on where the printing industry was and where it had been. Here was a guy talking about e-books and, and the future. It didn't sound like that amazing thing today, but imagine this was 14 years ago before the iPad. Needless to say, I used to love to listen to Frank talk about printing and how it would evolve. He motivated me to learn everything there was to know about printing. His passion was contagious. Whether he knows it or not, he was a huge motivational factor for me, uh, and I still keep his pocket pal handy when I'm training new salespeople. You need to understand the fundamentals. Sometimes people think that printing happens with the touch of a button. Those people then need to spend a couple days with Frank Romano. Marnie Soom, 2003 alumna, and she's also the design marketing specialist for the RIT Cary Graphic Arts Press. Taking a class with Frank was always exciting. 
His enthusiasm was a subject at hand and most inspirational and infectious. Michael Reardon, 1997 RIT alumnus and lecturer in the School of Media Sciences. I struggle to find people Frank doesn't know. As for me, I know him as a reason I stayed at RIT and as the model of integrity I perpetually look to. David Pankow, director of the RIT Press. Frank is one of those perfect storms of intelligence, enthusiasm, good humor, and he's a born teacher. When he walks into a room, every eye turns toward him for the latest breaking news in the graphic arts industry. Few others have mastered as well the transition from digital, uh, analog to digital, and done it with such inspiring confidence in the possibilities. Antonio Perez, the president and CEO of Kodak Corporation, said this about Frank. Frank has played a key role in helping all understand the dramatic shifts in technology that have occurred over the last few decades. He is a unique gift for helping people understand the past and how it's influencing the future and why the future is so exciting. The term print ambassador certainly fits when talking about Frank, and he reflects the personal professional commitment to advancing this medium. Twyla Cummings, Associate Dean of the College of Imaging Arts and Sciences. There are many things that impress me and amaze me about Frank. His passion for sharing knowledge unlike, is unlike anything I've ever seen. I always refer to him as a human computer. He is a great motivator, unending en energy, and has been a great supporter to me in my career at RIT. For that, I say thank you. These are a few of the people whose lives have been touched and influenced by Frank Romano. For over 50 years, he's blazed a trail around the globe to, in his quest for the vision of the, of the future of print and to educate leaders. On a personal note, I had the pleasure of working with Frank in a number of venues over the past two decades. In fact, uh, about 20 years ago, I wrote an article for Frank in this publication, Type World, which was well known around the industry. Uh, I also uh, thank Frank for recommending me to follow in his footsteps at RIT, and it's a distinct pleasure to be able to recognize you, Frank, for your amazing accomplishments in this venue in your hometown. At this time, I'd like Frank to come up and join us at the podium, as well as Provost Hafner and Dean Justice and Associate Dean Twyla Cummings. Save the copy of that I, I have it. It's in my own personal archives. <laughs> By the way, this was the Massachusetts spy of its day. <laughs> of its day, it was. So Frank, on behalf of the School of Media Sciences and the entire RIT community, I'm pleased to give you the certificate of recognition and appreciation, which was designed especially for you by professional calligrapher Chris Holmes. That's even better. Congratulations. Thank you. I'm surprised, I'm overwhelmed. I'm at an age now where I'm getting Lifetime Achievement Awards. <laughs> In fact, there are four scheduled over the next year. That, that, but this is especially special to me. Um, like Isaiah Thomas, um, I got into the publishing business and discovered that you can make a lot of money in, in publishing, especially if you sell your publication to a very large publishing company. And, um, and so I retired uh, at an early age and had nothing to do. And I got a call from RIT, would you like to teach for a year? Uh, 20 years later, I'm still involved. And, uh, and I think as I look at all these awards uh, that I've received, I've run out of walls in the house to put them on, but I think the awards that are most important to me are the young people that I have met and somehow been involved in their lives. And I continue that the only reason I'm on Facebook is because students ask me to be on Facebook. And I share what they're doing in their lives as they graduate, get jobs, have careers, have families, and I hear from them and learn from them as I go along. Wherever I travel in the world, I was in Dubai giving a speech and a young man comes up to me and I said, you look familiar. He said, I worked in your office in 1995 and the, uh, the ship went to Oman. He had driven from Oman, and I went there to meet with him and his family because our students come from all over the world. 
and I'll tell you, they inspire me. So thank you all very much. Let me add my congratulations to our award recipient and to Professor Emeritus Romano. Both recognitions are well deserved and the RIT, the College of Imaging Sciences, Imaging Arts and Sciences, and the School of Media Sciences applaud you. Planning events such as this requires a team of talented professionals. We are fortunate to have such a team working on this year's award program. I would like to thank our entire Isaiah Thomas Award in Publishing Committee, and at this time, I would ask that committee to please stand and be recognized. I would like to thank Ellen Dunlap and James Moran. Uh, Jim couldn't be here today. He is. Um, very much under the weather. So, I mean, he put such effort into um, making this event successful, so I'm really sorry he couldn't be here. Uh, but I'd like to thank both of them from AAS, Craig Milner of Creative Communications Consulting, and the WPI staff and family for their incredible support. Finally, I would like to thank Isaiah Thomas, portrayed by actor Neil Gustafson, for bringing a great Patriot printer back to life. Immediately following this program, we invite you to join us at the Antiquarian Hall for Society Tours and to view an exhibit featuring the works of Isaiah Thomas. Additionally, there will be a video slide presentation entitled The Isaiah Thomas Collection, a presentation of his life and work which was produced by Amelia Hugill Fontanelle and Chris Holmes in conjunction with the Cary Graphic Arts Library at RIT. You will also note the ornaments on the award certificates in the program are from the original ornament as it appeared in Thomas's History of Worcester. This book is also featured in the Cary Collection presentation. You don't want to miss this exhibit, so we encourage you to stop by. If you need directions to get there, there are plenty of people to show you the way. I thank you for joining us in today's celebration, and it is hoped that you will take away with you an appreciation for the le legacy of Isaiah Thomas, the printer, the publisher, the patriot, and the man. Thank you. I would just like to say, and this doesn't have to be recorded, for those of you who are joining us for lunch at the Goddard Daniels Mansion, uh, you can start moving that way in the next uh, 10 to 15 minutes, but please uh, enjoy, network, talk, uh, have a photo op with Isaiah. So, thank you.